do you say to God? God, you, you anointed me to be king, and I try to hang out. I do the things I think are right. I do the things I think I'm supposed to do. And I, like, yeah, the king tries to murder me. God, what's up? If David didn't have a right to the spirit of entitlement, how in the world do you? Your love is like radiant diamonds bursting inside us. We cannot contain your love is surely come find us like blazing wildfires singing your name come on sing with me church god of mercy sweet love of mine i have surrendered to your desire may this song across the skies these hallelujahs be multiplied come on just start to lift your heart to him this morning and place your attention on him right now you are so good lord Your love is like radiant diamonds bursting inside us. We cannot contain your love will surely come find us like blazing wildfire singing your that um, that this house is 
is important to the kingdom, you say, well, that, that, that's kind of a brag because you're, you're the head of it. No, actually, I'm not. Um, this is the Lord's house. We have to see it that way. We have to see that, that this is the house of the Lord. Uh, I'm, I'm not the shepherd here. I'm the under shepherd. Uh, I'm, I'm under the shepherd. Are you with me? And, and, and so, so I really believe that. And it's, it is my privilege to be part of this house. I'm, I'm part of it just the same as you are. I choose to be part of it just the same as you choose to be part of this house. Every house has a very specific purpose. And, and, uh, and, and no one house uh, is the end all of everything there is in the local church. We are a part of the local church. Are you with me? City Church is part of the local church of, of this whole city, part of the local church in this whole region, nation, and in the world. You understand that, right? You with me? Bang your hands together if you're with me. All right. Um, and, and it is important what we do with other houses. It really is. It, it's very important. Um, we believe in, in the whole church, even especially when they're very different from us. Um, you know, if, if the pastor wears a collar or robe, um, if, if, if the pastor wears a dress, are you with me? Um, if, if, if the people wear suits and ties, or if they come in t-shirts and shorts, you understand we're part of one body, and it's important that from time to time we function together. Y'all with me? Just like it's important for you to be here on a, on a Sunday morning, it's important when we do things like we're going to do next week and, and we have the... See, next week, um, I said to the pastors, I said, listen, I, I want this to have significant purpose. I want to... Um, I, I want that Palm Sunday is all about ushering in King Jesus into our city. How many of you want King Jesus ruling over your life? Bang your hands together if you want that, right? And, and oftentimes, God wants us to, to remind ourselves of that very thing. He wants us to make declaration. Um, you know as well as I do that, that during the week, life can take a toll on your life. Isn't that true? That... that that life imposes itself in places you don't want it to for your life and tries to rule that over. life should have no right to rule over and imposes itself. And how many of you know that, that you trying to counter rule life doesn't have a lot of effect, but when Jesus, King Jesus comes and rules, how many of you know his rule is absolute rule? As a matter of fact, Psalm 2 says, kiss the sun or perish. <laughs> you know, I think just sometimes we need to tell our problems, kiss the sun or perish. It's either kiss or off. Either way, you decide what you're going to do, but you can kiss off. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I just think we need to talk to our problems that way sometimes. I don't know about you, but I have to. Uh, you, don't have, you can be all religious if you want to. But I, I'm telling you, religion doesn't work in the trenches of life. Are you with me? I mean, look, really, it, it's all nice that we act all pious and, and high and lofty and put on our smile. But you know as well as I do, when life starts throwing mud balls at you, it, it, it's, time, it's time to roll up your sleeves and get a little nasty with life. Are you with me? And, and look, we, we have to understand that if we try to do this in and of our own strength, apart from God, it just doesn't work that way. But when you have pain in your life, touch someone and say, when you have pain. If you've ever had pain, in, listen to me. Y'all listening to me? Some of you aren't listening. Some of you playing your iPad. Come on, you got a game going on right now. And earphones in. Come on, somebody. Oh, I didn't just say that, did I? <laughs> Mothers are going like, put that down. <laughs> or kids are saying to their mothers, put that down. <laughs> yeah, I know. I see how often some of you are on Facebook. <laughs> how did you know that, Pastor? <laughs> Got me. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, if you do have uh, anything that's going to ring, buzz, you know, vibrate, any of that stuff, just please turn it down or off. All right. Um, I have no idea what I was saying. Somebody help me. Pain. Thank you. Yeah, kiss the sun or perish. Yeah, kiss off. Okay. All right. So if you've ever had pain in your life, and that pain imposed itself on you in a way that was just overwhelming and just rocked your world in, in a really bad way, if you've ever felt that before, just stand up real quick. Don't look around to see if other people are standing. <laughs> I'm talking about you. This isn't a comparison issue. All right, yeah, okay, pretty much everyone's standing up, yeah, yeah. So you know what I'm talking about. You, you, know, you know what it's like for pain to rock your world. Maybe it's, maybe it's in your marriage or a relationship. Maybe it's just with your kids or your, or your finances or your business. Maybe it's, maybe it's with school. Maybe it's, it's with the people that are around you in church. Maybe it's with your neighbor. Every one of us have experienced severe pain, and, and not one, not one of, of our situations are identical to the person beside us. Even if it's your spouse standing beside you, it is different to you than it is to them. Pain hits me from a situation different than it hits my wife. That pain is unique to each one of you. Why doesn't God just take all the pain away? Why doesn't he remove the pain? Why, why doesn't he make it all just pleasant? I mean, really, does he have the power to do that? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. So, so why doesn't he do that? It, 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 it blows me away how no matter where I go, I'm telling you, people just start to preach. I'm not talking about just Christians. It's the truth. I was sitting with a group of guys yesterday at a chili cook-off, and this guy sitting beside me, a retired state policeman, uh, a Navy SEAL, I'm a bare-knuckle fighter. This guy is bad to the bone. He's 70 years old now, and I'm telling you, he could take out most young men. That's just who he is. His name's Teddy. Teddy, if you're watching, yes, I'm talking about you. But he, 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 I'm, I'm sitting at this chili cook-off, and he starts preaching the gospel. It's amazing. Why? Because when you, when you walk into an area, what's on you starts to get on others. Are you with me? When Saul was around the prophets, Saul, like he just, he started prophesying. He started prophesying to such an extent, he started taking his clothes off and getting naked before God. That, that's not, that's not a, and Teddy didn't do that, okay, all right, so. That, that's not a weird sexual kind of thing. Don't look at it that way. That's not what it was. But sometimes we put, we cover ourselves from God. Sometimes, what, what did Adam and Eve do? In the garden, they took, they took fig leaves and they covered themselves because they were ashamed. They knew they were naked before God. They, they were trying to hide part of themselves from God. Do you hear me? They, they, can I clue you in? He knows. But see, that's what shame does. Shame tries to get you to keep part of you away from God because you somehow think that that's too dirty for God, that that isn't really good, that, that that isn't, like that's too much for the blood of Jesus. And what did God do? God made them take off the fig leaves, and what did he do? He covered them, but with what? Animal skins. Now, I got a theory. There's only one kind of animal skin that God could possibly have used to cover them. 
it was a lambskin. Because only the blood of the lamb could cover their sin. There's only one kind of animal that could have been. And so even in the very first sin, God projected from the cross back into the very first sin in the garden, he projected the blood of Jesus because they were feeling pain. Why pain though? Why? 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 why if, if God's going to soothe us, soothe, us, soothe us, if he's going to heal us, if he's going to give us relief, take away our pain, why not just not allow the pain to begin with? Because, because that pain is an indication that something is wrong. It's an indication that the kingdom of God is not ruling in that particular place. It's an indication that the enemy is loose and uh, afoot and up to something that is contrary to the will of God in your life. When, when that pain hits you, that pain is really a gauge to say the enemy is at work. If it wasn't, pain moves us to do things we wouldn't otherwise have done. That's what emotions are for. Emotions move us to do things. Come on. The, 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 the infatuation that comes along with romantic love moves us to do things it wouldn't otherwise do. You know how much money I spent driving up over the mountain to, to my, my in-law's house? It's just economically not wise to do that. But how many of you know that, that emotions cause us to supersede what we otherwise would have thought was prudent and moves us into the place of capturing something that we wouldn't otherwise have captured? When you feel pain and that gauge goes off, God has your attention. Or at least, no, no, wait. That's not true. That pain has your attention. Now the question is, what do you look to for the source of relieving of your pain? Is it a bottle? Is it a needle? Is it sex? Is it money? Is it power? Is it pride? What is it? Or is it God? There's only one thing that's really going to relieve the pain. All right? All right. You can all be seated. You thought I forgot. Not that that's ever happened. Was it, was, it, was it your wedding? Was it your wedding? That we had the people stand the whole time. I never allowed them to sit down. And they, the, the people were so gracious at the wedding. They were like, oh, we thought that was just the way you did weddings. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> it's not that I forgot to have you all sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Phew, thank you, Lord. <laughs> They're definitely seeing the best in that one. So pain. L listen to the scripture. Second Corinthians one three. We read it last week, N four. It said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Say comfort. Who comforts us. Say comforts. He comforts us in all our tribulation, pain, okay, that we may be able to comfort. Say comfort. Those who are in any, say any, any trouble, any trouble. Now, the enemy would put an asterisk there. The enemy is very good at putting asterisks, exceptions. Well, I mean, after all, he's a legalist, right? And so he puts an asterisk there and says, well, any trouble except for the one you caused yourself. Any trouble except for 
Fill in the blank. How often has the thought come to you that I don't deserve any comfort in this situation because I, how many times have we been told, you made the bed, you sleep in it? How many times have you felt like you, you had no right to go to God about this? If you would have listened to him in the beginning, you wouldn't have got in that mess. Hey, how many leaders have told us that? How many times has we have, as leaders told other people that? The truth of the matter is, it really doesn't matter what the trouble is. The Word of God says any. Now, if you want to change the Word of God, then here's my suggestion to you. You go to God and you petition the courts of God that His Word is wrong and that your definition is much better. And if God allows you to change that, if He allows you to take out the word any and put the word some in, then you come to me and you tell me that that's what God told you to do. Are we okay on that? But until then, you have to accept the definition as it is written. Say that. Say, as it is written. Say that again. As it is written. There's power in those words. As it is written. Not as you define it. As it is written. Touch someone. Say, as it is written. Touch them back and say, not as you define it. Come on, touch them one time. Say, not as you define it, but as it is written. See, that's the problem. So often we take what God said and we change it and define it differently based on our circumstances. When did God ever give you that right? When did God ever say to you, that your circumstances really should change the Word of God to the extent that it applies correctly to your understanding and your circumstances. No, when Jesus came up against the enemy, what did he say? As it is written, not even as, God, not even as Jesus felt about it, as it is written. Now, I read this, and I see that it says, any trouble, when you find someone in any trouble, touch someone, say any trouble. Now, do you understand that doesn't have any exceptions to it? If it's trouble, say that, if it's trouble, then it's included. How many of you have had troubles? Let me see your hands. In any time in your life, wave your hand at me if you've ever had troubles. All right, good. Now, wave your hand at me if you currently have troubles. Wave your hands. Yeah. Okay, I'm with you. Now, here's what you find. When you have troubles, that is the incursion of the enemy into your life, your sphere, your metron. Because if it's your trouble, it's your sphere of influence. Are you with me? Now, let me give you a little tip. Just, just a little tip. How many would like a little tip? All right. Just a just little, little rabbit trail, little side note. You ready? Don't take on troubles that aren't yours. Because you don't have the authority to deal with them. Don't take on the problems of the world unless God called you to deal with the troubles of the world. Don't take on the problems of your neighbor unless God called you to deal with them. Now, if he called you into that, then take that trouble. Are you with me? The problem is we take on troubles that are not our own. We don't have authority to deal with them. And so now we have a trouble we have no authority to deal with. God will not summons us into that problem because he didn't call us to that problem. We take on that problem. We're carrying a weight of someone. I, I'll tell you, I, I learned these words and they are so powerful. That's not my problem. You say, well, I'm sorry, Pastor, but as a believer, we should take on people's troubles. Where is that written? Where is it written that I'm to take on your troubles? Sufficient of the troubles for today, let alone, look, you got troubles tomorrow waiting on you. But God himself told you, don't worry about those. You can't deal with troubles in tomorrow. You're not in tomorrow. You're in today. Deal with the troubles you have today. And the troubles you had in the past that are no longer troubles to you, stop owning those. You're past those. 
You can't go back and fix him. Yeah, but pastor, you don't understand. If only I would have completed that pass in the end zone, I'd be in the NFL right now. Do you understand? That was midget football. Are you kidding me? So let the past go. Let, let, let the future worry about itself. But what is on your plate today and you're feeling pain from, that's yours. If it's yours. Don't take on the problem that someone talked about on Facebook. Please don't ask me to do that. Don't, and y'all going to get mad at me, but I got to tell you this because this is the truth. Stop asking me to pray for things that are yours. I know, I know, I know. That doesn't sound very nice, but I've not been called to be nice. I've called to be kind. There's a difference between being nice and being kind. Nice is is what you want me to say or do that makes you feel good. Kind is what God wants me to say or do that puts you in the right place. I would much rather you be in the right place and feel bad than you be in the wrong place and feel good. Are you with me? And so I have to say the things that are kind rather than the things that are nice. Don't ask me to pray for things when they're on your plate and God gives you the power to deal with them because it's not me that solves the problem. It is God who solves the problem. And you have the same access to the throne of God that I have. And what does it add? You say, well, 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 pastor, I mean, don't you have intercessors here? And don't you sometimes assign intercessors to pray for things? Yes, because it's part of their plate. It's part of their metron. It's part of what God has called them to do. But don't, look, don't post on the Facebook, hey, I need prayers. Look, I know I've done it. You've done it. But, but here's what that does. That makes some suspicious, no, I'm sorry, superstitious kind of, of request that if, if I get enough people praying about something, that something's going to happen. And listen, that can border on witchcraft. And yes, I know I'm making someone mad right now, but please hear my heart. You're more powerful than that. If you can get on Facebook, if you can put on an email, offer up prayers, then just don't do that and stop and you come because you're feeling pain. Now listen, that's important. You're feeling pain. Now this scripture that, that I need to finish, it says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comforts, say comfort, who comforts us, comforts us in all of our tribulation, say tribulation, all our tribulation, say all, all our tribulation, even what we cause ourselves, even the, even the, even the, the stuff we do intentionally. Come on, somebody. It says all, doesn't it? Tell me some way around that. Tell me the worst thing that you've done. Tell me the thing you deserve the most that's bad. And I'm going to include it in that. Tell me the, the worst thoughts that you've had. Tell me where you messed up the most. Tell me where you've been unfaithful the most. Tell me when you haven't read your Bible and you haven't prayed and you haven't gone to church. Well, God, I have no right. Yes, you do. Because he said all. He didn't say all if you went to church. He didn't say all if you sent out birthday cards. Come on, somebody. He said all. Say all then listen, who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. Are we getting this yet? What do we comfort them with? With the comfort with, we, with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So this comfort thing is a pretty big deal. God comforts us, we comfort them. In what? In anything. You say, well, but, but they were just being bad parents. Yes. And comfort them. Well, but they put the needle in their own arm. Yes. And comfort them. Now, now what does it mean to comfort? 
It's, it's like if I grab that, you know, my little boy, we saw, said last week, grab the hot curling iron, and he, he burned the whole palm of his hand. He did that himself. Yeah, but he was only five, four, two, something like that. Don't hate us, all right? We didn't know it was going to do that. Stop it. I can see your old wheels turning. Kind of mother. No. Okay, so his hand's burnt. What does he want at the moment? At the moment, he wants some kind, yeah, it to stop hurting, soothing, healing, relieving, right? That burn spray, right? You've seen the burn spray, right? Right? It works. It really does work. And, you know, it's still painful, but it's still painful, but, but it does ease it. Thank you. Here. <laughs> you got it going on, girl. You're, you're with me. All right. So just help me. Help me. Touch someone and say, help me. All right. So, so look, so, so we want relief. But the word comfort means with strength. And I don't feel strong right now. I do feel relieved. I feel a little better than I did, but I don't feel strong yet. The only way for me to feel strong is to be able to know that I'm not going to get burnt every time I turn around in life. That the pain that I'm feeling right now has purpose to it. It's purpose by God. And the word comfort literally means soothe, heal, relieve, but it also means something very, very, very important. It's the word summons. Like I'm summonsed to the court. That, how many of you know in courts you do business? In courts there are verdicts that are made and carried out. In courts you find where injustice is taking place and you bring justice, and then you bring the power and authority to deal with that injustice, and you remove that injustice. So you're being summoned, not just comforted, soothed, healed, relieved, but summoned into the place of being able to deal with the source of that pain. We, we know that now, right? We talked about that all last week. The, the irony in all of this is last week I'm talking about being summoned in, in jury duty, and you know, you get a summons with jury duty. On Tuesday morning, sitting on at the dining room table, after the kids got the mail on Monday, Janice will put my mail on, 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 in the morning right in front, in especially important mail, and there is this white envelope. And inside the white envelope, it has this window, and I could see it was red. And I'm like, you can't be serious. And I open up this thing, and sure enough, summons to jury duty. I thought, you know what? This is either extreme irony, or God has a tremendous sense of humor. And I heard God laughing. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then I paid a picture on Facebook, and someone, who I won't mention Travis's name, said, are you going to go? It's like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding? So, so we're summoned. Now, what do you do once you're summoned? What do you do? How do we actually deal with that pain? God is summoning us to deal with the source of that pain because he recognizes that there is, there is a, a rogue government out there that's enforcing something on his kids that he doesn't want enforced. It's a defeated government. Come on, somebody. I'm going to say it again. It's a defeated government. How many of you know when Jesus died, when he gave his life, when they, they nailed him to the cross? Let me take a step back. Every place that Jesus bled, up unto the crucifixion, and including the crucifixion, every place that Jesus bled his blood, what was it that dealt with the sin back in the garden? It wasn't the skin. The lamb skins were just evidence of the shed blood. Are you with me? It was the blood that dealt with the sin of mankind. So every time that Jesus bled, he bled seven times, we have recorded 
in the word. He bled seven times, not just on the cross. He bled when they beat him. You can imagine, right? Can you imagine what bloody scene that was? Blood splattered everywhere. Blood spattered on the Roman soldiers. Oh, that'll preach. Could it have been the same soldier that beat him that was standing beneath the cross and said, this truly is the Son of God? See, that blood will change you. He was bled. He bled when they thrust the crown of thorns on his head. They grabbed his beard and they ripped it from his, his face and he bled. It said they, they beat him to where you could hardly recognize his appearance. And so he was bruised. That's bleeding under the skin. How many of you know that, that God wants to deal not just what's on the surface, but he wants to deal what's under the skin? He wants to deal not just with our identity as we are, see ourselves physically in the mirror, but he wants to deal with our identity that's on the inside, the way we feel and see ourselves. Are you with me? Seven times he bled. Every time he bled, Jesus was purchasing with his blood something back for you and I. When he, he knelt in the garden, it says that, that he prayed and he sweated as great, great drops of blood. I believe he literally bled because of of the weight of what he was feeling and the intensity of how he prayed, the blood was coming out of his pores. When he bled at that moment, he said these words. He said, Father, if there's any way you can take this cup from me, please take it. But then he said, not my will, but thy will be done. Up until that point, man struggled and did not have power over being able to do the will of God. Man failed miserably to serve God prior to the ushering in of the kingdom of God. But at that moment, Jesus purchased for us as he bled, as he prayed, and he said, not my will, but thy will be done. He purchased the ability for you to do. Not just want to do, but to do. Not just hope to do, but to do. Not just to point at someone else and say, you need to, but for me to do the will of God. He purchased, paid for, sealed, and applied to you the ability, when you said yes to Jesus, in whatever way you said that, whether it was a prayer prayed, whether it was a song that you sang, whether it was simply just a yielding of your heart, it doesn't matter. If Jesus is Lord of your life, then he takes and he assigns that blood to you and he seals it on you and he says, now they have the ability to say yes. They have the ability to do the will of God. And so when I hear believers say, well, I just can't. Liar, liar, pants on fire. You can. You choose not to. The grace is there. The ability is there. He paid the price. Don't make his blood inefficient. Don't make his blood unable. He paid the price. You can. Just someone been telling you too long. You couldn't. Are you with me? Every time he bled, he paid the price. And so now, we have the full ability... When we are summoned by God to pull our shoulders back, lift our head up, and walk before the Lord into His courts, we have that ability. Don't tell me you don't. He paid the price. He paid the price for you to walk sin free. You say, well, I don't walk sin free. I know that. But look, even when you have trouble and you're having struggles walking this thing out, he promises that we're here. But, but notice what it says. Notice what it says going back to 2 Corinthians. Check this out. Tell someone say, check this out. 
He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we, we, say we, we, say we, we, say one more time, we, we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. The moment you sign up for the kingdom of God, you now become responsible to help comfort those who need comfort. First thing you've got to do is be comforted. That's the first thing. The second thing you get to do is comfort others. That's why it's important to be part of the body of Christ. That's why it's important for you not to just come in here and sit and walk yourself out and and leave everyone else alone, but understand that you've been called by God to be comforted and to comfort. Are you with me? Young people, you are called to be comforted and to comfort. Here's the problem. The moment that you say, I'm not going to comfort others, you stop the flow. You block this thing up. You put the plug on the whole deal and you get filled up with the comfort of God, right? But then there's no more room for new comfort to come in. Why? Because you're not pouring that back out. It's like like oil being poured in a vessel with a very specific hole in it that's to pour out to other vessels. And when you choose to plug that up, What happens? The oil begins to back up. God's pouring into you comfort. God's pouring into you comfort. God's pouring into you comfort. But you say, I'm not going to comfort anyone else. I got hurt the last time I tried to do that. Or people told me to get my nose out of their business when I tried to do that. Or they rejected me. Or add in your excuse. I've got them too. I get tired of it. I get tired of helping people. Well, the reason I get tired of helping people is because I haven't accessed the heart of God. Because I start, I disconnect from God to some extent. I'm, come on, take that right. You know I don't completely disconnect from God. But I stop looking to Him for my source, and since He's no longer my source, then what reservoir I got on the inside of me, I'm pouring out based on that, and eventually I come to the end of that. When I come to the end of that, I realize that I disconnected from God. And because I disconnected from God, I got nothing more to give. And too many people, especially in leadership, are trying to to pour out comfort to people when they don't have the constant flow of God in their life. And and really, they get burned out. I hear that term in ministry, oh, he's burned out. Yeah, I, I understand that. But it's important to stay connected with God. Stay connected with the Father's heart of love. And when you do that, you have this constant flow. Here's what happens. I mean, it's it's, it's like like that vessel. Like God's got this pipe about this big pouring into me, and I got this this hole about this big pouring out, right? And so I'm I'm pouring out to people. I'm pouring out, okay, Brian needs some comfort. Okay, I'm going to pour out to Brian. And God's just got this big gushing pipe coming on the inside of me, right? It's just pouring down over top of my head like I got this big opening on my head, right? And so it's just, it's just flowing over me. Anyone gets around me, they get underneath me, whatever. They got this oil running down over them. I mean, I'm intentionally pouring this thing. And the overflow of my life just spills over onto people. That's why when you sit near someone, they start preaching it. You don't have to wonder. Because it's just, it's just God pouring out on other people. Are you with me? You see it happen. Maybe you don't even recognize it's going on because it's so normal. It just happens all the time around you. But that's the way this thing flows and functions. And so so you're pouring out to other people the comfort of God that God is pouring into you. That's the way it's supposed to work. That's why the body of Christ is so important. That's why you're important. That's why you're here. It's so so. You can stay connected with, it's important. It's important to to make the adjustment periodically. It's important to, to, uh, okay, so you got that opening and and you're receiving from God. But how many of you know life, the winds of life blow around, right? And sometimes they blow you off course a little bit and you try to adjust. And every now and then, it's important for someone who's standing on the outside is able to, come here, Joey. Come here, Jen. All right, Jen's, Jen's going to be God. She's going to stand up here. And, good, stand clear up here. All right, and she's, God is pouring into Joey. Here, turn around. He's pouring into Joey. Just pour into Joey like this, right? Pouring into Joey. Now, now the, the winds of life are just blowing him around. So he, he adjusts. He, he, we try to adjust on our own, right? 
Look, if you're living for God, you're wanting to stay close to God, right? Y'all with me? Keep pouring. I don't know. I don't know. She's scaring me. All right. So she's pouring in, right? In the, in the winds of life. Here, Janice, come. You be the winds of life. I know you'll enjoy this. All right. All right. So, so the winds of life are blowing, and, 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 and Joey, all right. oh, she likes that way too much. Okay. All right. Wow. Come on, God. Keep pouring. Don't stop. Don't stop. Okay. Now push him really, really hard. Push him. No, wait, wait. Don't hurt him. I mean, just push him. Don't hit him. Come on. It's the winds of life, not the sledgehammer of life. All right. Now, wait. Now, wait. Now, now the problem is now life, life dealt him a major blow. And, and you know what? He kept adjusting as much as he could. But the problem is he doesn't want to go back to that place because of the pain that life has inflicted. Life now has a name. All right? And so what has to happen? And so what has to happen is the people that love Joey. All right, come here, Kenny. Come here. Come here, Jess. Wait, wait. You're still back here. You're, you're, all right. So, so look, the people that, that are connected with Joey, all right? All right? Yeah. All right? And, and they... I love, look, push against him a little bit. Life's pushing against him, but look, they can push him back into the place. See? Hey, this is what life can really be like. Trust me, I live with her. All right? All right? But, but do you see when we keep other... Now, now you guys step aside. So, so, so he pushes them away. He doesn't want to be connected to them because of the pain that he feels. Because he didn't see pain as a summons. He saw pain as something I got to stay away from. Where God gave him pain to pull him in to deal with the problem of life, he didn't. And because of that, life's still a nagging person to him. This... <laughs> You say, oh, I wonder what's going on there. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. This is an ex- Say this is an example. Yeah, it is. Yeah, okay. All right. But no, no, really. So, so here, the church comes alongside Joey and says, okay, and encourages him, shows him that the pain is a summons to deal with the problem of life. So, so they empower him, uh, make him aware. He responds correctly. Go ahead, make him aware. All right, you just touch him, make him aware, show him that life can be dealt with, okay? And he turns around because God, he's in the right place. God is pouring into him, right? And so he turns around and he deals with life correctly. Go ahead, deal with life. All right, all right. Good job. Give me a hand clap. All right, I, I need to share. I'm going to give you, I'm going to go very quickly through 10 steps. Rick, if you'd work with me on this, as I give a step, could you put it up there so people could see it? Okay, could you work with me on that? Okay. Now, what do you do when you're summoned? How do you respond to the summons? There's pain. You call out to God for comfort. Now, what do you do? The very first thing you do is, according to Psalm 100, verse 4 and 5. It says this. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Say thanksgiving. So the very first thing you have to do to enter into his courts correctly or to enter in with thank, You don't even get in the gate unless you have a thankful heart. If, if you're peeved at God, you got to deal with that first. So you can restore the heart of thanksgiving. If you... If you do not see God as your provider, if you think somehow you deserve the good things that's coming to you, it's because you deserve them, you're messed up. you got the wrong heart. And you've got to stop, and you've got to lose the spirit of entitlement. you got to get rid of that thing. Now listen, that spirit's big in this area. People believe they're entitled. I hear people say like, where is my welfare check? I deserve it. 
Why? Where is my check from my employer? Wait. You got fired. But I deserve a job. No, no, you don't. You deserve if if you if you work hard and if they believe you're valuable to them to work for them and get a paycheck, they don't owe you anything but that paycheck. Listen, we need to lose the spirit of entitlement. It's not your employer that's your provider. It's not your work that's your provider. It's your God that's your provider. And the sooner you get that straight, the better off you're going to be. And listen, he doesn't have to provide for your needs. He gets to provide for your needs. He doesn't do, out of, uh, do it out of a sense of obligation to you. He does it out of a sense of love to you. And the moment you start barking at God, and saying, where is my? You have lost Thanksgiving, and you have a spirit of entitlement on you. That spirit is detrimental to the believer because you lose the right heart. You lose the love of God. You, you, you're, you're, you're demanding from God based on your deeds or based on what you think that you deserve. You don't deserve. Well, let me tell you what you deserve. You deserve death, hell, and the grave the same as I do. You sin. You've fallen short just like I have. Every one of us deserve nothing from God, but he loves us and has rest- he restored us. His blood was shed for us. Yeah, but I made Jesus Lord of my life, and I've been living for him, and I've been reading my Bible, and I've been going to church. That's all for you. Well, what about me paying my tithe? That's for you. You're the one that's blessed when that happens. God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He doesn't need your money. You need to give your money. Wait a minute. Why do I need to give my money? So he can take it, multiply it, send it back to you blessed. Are you with me? Look, these are kind words. These aren't nice words. I get it. But I love you enough to tell you these things. So we've got to enter his courts with thanksgiving, his gates with thanksgiving. Now, once we have a thanksgiving heart, you say, well, Dude, I, I don't even know what you're talking about, the courts of God. I've never been in the courts of God. Well, maybe you need to adjust your heart a little bit, and you haven't been able to get into the gate to get into the courts. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts. Say courts. Courts with praise. You know what praise is? Let me tell you what praise is. Let me give you the best example I've ever seen of praise. King David who we see more of King David's life than I think anyone else's life in the Bible. More than Paul, more than Saul, more than Samson, more than Elijah, more than anyone else in the Word of God, we see from just about beginning to end David's life. So there's a reason God did that. There's a reason he underscored this man. And so David... David as a boy did some crazy things for God. And yet, if you read the Psalms, he never had a spirit of entitlement. He never said to God, I deserve this. As much as he did more for God than than anyone I can read up until that point in time. And he never said, God, I deserve this. He always said, God, I'm unworthy of this. But what you give me, thank you. And here's David, who kills a giant single-handedly helps deliver Israel, is anointed king as a little boy, and from the time he's anointed king, he has on him the potential of becoming the king of Israel. Not just the potential, he's anointed by God to become king. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like God has told you you're going to do great things? Have you ever told you, like, like the things that God wants me to do are so amazing? And so you embark on that journey of, of, of doing those things. And so David goes in and he starts to work in the courts of the king. Because, after all, if I'm going to be king, I need to hang out around kings. And what does that king do? Tries to kill him. 
Several times he tries to stab him with a spear. So David leaves the courts of Saul and thinking, well, if I at least leave that, that dog alone, he's not going to bite me. And so he goes and he starts to, 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 to just run from Saul. What Saul do? Hunts him. Takes whole armies. Hunts him. And David, he's just trying to get through, trying to get by. How in the world do you reconcile all that? How do you say to God, God, you, you anointed me to be king, and I try to hang out. I do the things I think are right. I do the things I think I'm supposed to do. And I, like, the king tries to murder me. God, what's I, if David didn't have a right to the spirit of entitlement, how in the world do you? Think about it. Saul chases him all. So then he goes over to the Philistines. The, he figures, hey, listen, if Saul doesn't recognize what's on my life and he doesn't want to raise me up as king, then I'm going to go to his enemy. And I'm going to go over to the Philistines. So he goes to the Philistines and he, he, he deceptively starts raiding Philistine villages. And the way he keeps the Philistines from finding out is he kills all the people. Kills all the people. By the way, David wrote that psalm. Any trouble, all tribulation. If anyone des des deserved to burn in hell, it was David. And he knew. He knew that it was only the goodness of God. And the crazy part is, he expected the goodness of God. So he's raiding all these villages, and one time he's out raiding, and he comes home to his village that the Philistine king gave him to have charge over, and he finds his village burned to the ground. He and his 400 mighty men, their houses are burned to the ground, their wives and children, their animals, their donkeys, their pigs, their ducks are taken, stolen away, and now you can just imagine What's going on in David's head? What's going on with my wives? What's going on with my children? What are they doing to them? Everything that David valued and held dear at that moment. Look, I'm just trying to work out this will of God thing. I'm just trying to do what God wants me to do. I don't know how else to do it. I mean, there's no manuscript. There's no book. There's no, there's no owner's manual of how I'm supposed to rule and reign and become king. I don't know how to do this. I'm just doing what I feel I should be doing. And this is what God gives me? And he falls on his knees right in the middle of his house that's in ashes. And he hears the murmurings of his mighty men. They start blaming him. His family's gone, his wealth is gone, and even those he counted as valued brothers they're, they're, they're deciding how they're going to kill him. Now, if anyone has a right to curse God and die, I think it was David at that moment. If anyone ever would have been justified to do that, at that moment, he could have done that. But see, he shows us why he was a man after God's own heart. It says, while he was in his knees, in the dust, in the ashes, it said he began to remind himself of the goodness of God. In the worst moment of his life, in the moment of greatest despair, of, of, of greatest, what he could have felt is punishment from God. He knew that God wasn't punishing him. He knew that God would show up, that the goodness of God would appear. He knew that God would make himself known if he just continued to trust God. Let me tell you, when your pain meter is at its highest, it is the greatest summons. It is the summons to come in to the trust of the Lord. It's to come into the courts of God. It's come in to the place of the Spirit and not what you see going on around you. It's the place to enter into the greatness of God in the land of the living. 
and watch the goodness of God appear as you never let go of trusting God. 